Hi everyone and welcome to another NIDA in conversation. I'm Tasneem Hussain, I'm a playwright and director um, and I'm joined today by Osama Sami. Um, we, I just want to uh, acknowledge before we begin that I'm joining you from Gadigal land, um, this beautiful country that we're on and it was and always will be Aboriginal land and it is a privilege to be able to tell stories on this country. Um, so Osama who is joining us this afternoon is an actor, writer, director, poet, and stand-up comedian. So does a few things. Um, he's of Iraqi heritage and was born and raised in Iran before moving to Australia in the mid to late 90s as a teenager with his family. Um, he starred in Ali's Wedding, which everyone should check out on Netflix now, which he co-wrote. Well, I mean, after this chat. Um, the screenplay earned him an Australian... Um, uh, what does actor, actor Award? I never remember what it stands for. Uh, an AWG uh, Award, so the Australian Writers Guild Award, an Australian Film Critics Association Award, and a Film Critics Circle of Australia Award for Best Original Screenplay. So that was just for the writing, but for his portrayal of Ali, the titular character, which was based on his own life, he received nominations for Best Lead Actor for a stack of awards. Um, the film itself also received the Sydney Film Festival Audience Award for Best Feature Film, among many others. Asama also published a memoir, Good Muslim Boy, which won the New South Wales Premier's Literary Award and was highly commended um, for the Victorian Premier's Literary Award. He then adapted it for stage, selling out seasons at Malthouse Theatre Company in Melbourne and QT Queensland Theatre. Asama has played many roles on screen and on stage, including around Australia and internationally. He was the recipient of the triennial Golden Phoenix International Award for his contribution to Iraqi culture in diaspora. And he's also listed as a notable Australian Muslim by the Commonwealth of Australia. I, think that's, that, I think that's It still goes. <laughs> oh, it keeps going. Please, one more oh, sentence. Oh, please don't look. In 2017, he was the winner of the Creative Muslim of the Year at the Australian Muslim Achievement Awards. Asama, thank you for joining us. No, thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, notable Australian Muslim. I think that's more to do with my name <laughs> being Osama. In a I'm like, come on, there's at least four. There's at least four in a population of like 25 million or whatever it is now. So, like, take it. <laughs> um. I wanted to ask you before we begin, because I mean, I guess a lot of people might have seen your work on um, on film, but you've also done a lot of work in theatre and kind of where you started off as well was in plays with your family and the community. I wanted to ask you about when you knew that you wanted to perform, that you enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks. And hello, everybody um, watching. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners, custodians of the land of song and dance and story. I'm on Wurundjeri land here. And uh, uh, it is a privilege really um, uh, to be able to share stories with, with uh, everyone here today. Um, when I knew, I think you know as a kid, don't you? When, when you're little, you just, so I grew up in Iran during the Iran-Iraq war and that lasted for eight years and so stories became an escape an escape of reality because the reality was the bombs being dropped and you know lost a brother during the war and an uncle and it was really tough for a kid watching that so stories my dad would he was fighting on the front line but every year he would have like a couple of weeks off and then he would come home and he would read me stories from Kalila Wadimna or A Thousand and One Nights, the, you know, the story of Shahrazad and the King. And I was really hypnotized by the magic of those stories and transported into another world and it became another reality. So from a very young age, I began, yeah, just loving anything to do with story and then eventually through performance and even at school uh, I was sort of performing in different plays and so I, I knew that I loved to write and clearly to talk as you can see um, to love to write and talk just just to, to to share stories at a young age whether it was performance or whether it was 
uh, oral or you know written or whatever. So so yeah, it came at a at a young at a young age. Well, I want to ask about I guess you know your continuing journey into that. Did you train formally? Was it all stuff that you learned on the job? Like how how did you go about making this um, something that you did as a job? Yeah, I maybe I've never looked at it as a job and. Mm -hmm. Definitely, my mum still doesn't think I have a job, even though, like, you know, I've got a movie on Netflix. I'm working on two TV shows, and she still says, "When are you when are you gonna become a doctor?" You know, because <laughs> you know, in our community, you're either a doctor or a taxi driver. There's no middle ground, and um, the, the the arts, that being that dreamer, is not something that's tangible. Um, formal training. I got to see. I, I, I when I arrived in Australia as a teenager, I was illiterate in English. I couldn't talk, couldn't read, couldn't write. Uh, in fact, I, I, this was my level of of uh, my the mastery I had of the English language. Is that uh, when we landed in Melbourne? Of course, I've just come from Iran. My eyes just uh, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And I remember reading uh, this sign at the airport and I was so happy and proud to be able to phonetically say out the letters. And I said to my dad, 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 look, um, that that sign there says, can you read it? It says taxi. And and he, he, he was where? And I, I said, there, look, T-X-E, taxi. And I was just phonetically saying it. And then he looked at it and he said, Oh, no, son, that says exit. You're reading a right to left like Arabic. I was reading it the other way around. So that was my level of English <laughs> until I realized, oh, my God, of course, they read from left to right as opposed to us who read and write right to left. And uh, so that was sobering. And then uh, so, so yes, yeah, so, which brings me to formal training. So I came in, had to go to high school straight away. And, you know, imagine doing year 11, year 12 when your English sucks. It's, I mean, imagine doing year 11, 12 anyway, let alone when you, when you, don't, it's when the you, don't, best. When you don't speak English. So it was a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure to do well, you know, son of an educated man and uh, community pressure and everything. So the arts sort of took a back seat. I did a, a um, went into computer science and, uh, and and tried various different avenues and and to be honest I didn't really think I was good enough like to get into a place like NIDA. I failed to get into the VCA a couple of times and um, auditioned and then the next year I auditioned and, and back then they just said you you have too strong an accent you, yeah, and, and you like how, like you know you have to audition a Shakespeare piece I can barely yeah. barely read a year 10 novel uh, so it was quite tough but you know you just got to persist obviously so so then uh, I started doing community theatre and just love theatre and that was the first place where I started like you're saying you know I do a lot of film and TV work now but my love is theatre, live theatre, the, the the ephemeral nature of it, the, the nature that it mimics life in a way. It's there one moment, it's gone. You don't pause and replay like we are speaking now, it's just happening. So, um, yeah, theatre's where it all sort of started. And then, of course, you know, you get one job leads to the other. But I knew that I had to become multidimensional even if I wasn't you know, jack of all trades, master of none. Like I, I just thought maybe, you know, because I love to write and by the mid-2000s I had a stronger grasp of the English language. I uh, studied English literature and um, and started getting to writing and then, uh, and then of course, doing a bit of stand-up, doing, you know, and it just one one thing sort of leads to another and sort of under the umbrella of storytelling. Because even actors, you're not just an actor, you're a storyteller. You're part of the collaborative storytelling machine. So Yeah, very much so. 
I mean, you said earlier that you, you know, you described yourself as being illiterate in English when you arrived, but I guess that's one of the things that people forget about migrants is that they're literate in something else. And you yourself speak Arabic and Persian, um, and those cultures have very rich kind of oral storytelling history. Is Does that ever, I guess, uh, shape the kinds of stories you tell or how you tell them? Of course, yeah, absolutely. We're all a product of our world, the world that we live in, the perception of the world that we live in, uh, what we consume, uh, and definitely Persian literature and Arabic literature, Persian and Arabic poetry uh, has, and storytelling of the thousands of years of storytelling has had a strong influence on the way I perceive the world as well and the multiple identities that you take and the way we think. Uh, anyone who's uh, listening in, I'm, I'm sure if, 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 if you, if you're a bilingual, you know that so often you have dreams in another language and you think differently in another language. And it's not just the language as in the words that come out of your mouth, but it's just as a human being how you present yourself. That's why there's the stereotypes or the archetypes about the loud race or the quiet race or the or just the way, the demeanour in which you present yourself to the world. And... Um, yeah, it, it's had a, a profound effect on the way I tell stories and I tell the stories that are important to my heart, but also I feel are stories that, so f forever in a day, I feel like people, whether you're Muslim or Arab or Middle Eastern, as a minority, you're uh, sort of forever talked about, but not heard from. And, and you want to take, instead of just sucking in a corner and saying, oh, they don't listen to me and, oh, sad me, I never get cast in anything. Or, I, well, I do get cast in everything when it's a terrorist. Like, it's like, you know, you know like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to sort of have a suck about it. You go, well, what can I do about it? And, of course, it's not as simple as I'm saying it now. It's a realisation that you have over a, call, a journey. But it's what I learned that you can that you can be the change that you want to see in the world and it's giving a voice to the myriad beautiful colorful often brutal stories that uh, people from the migrants migrants in, endure and, and have to give as well yeah absolutely i mean you mentioned you know the the process of i guess learning that you can share your own story and finding ways to get stuff out there for yourself. I mean, I guess a really great example is the film we mentioned right at the start of this, Ali's Wedding. What was the process like for that? You know, I guess when people have talked about it in the media, it's all very like, oh, wow, it's a Muslim rom-com, which seems to blow people's minds that Muslims experience romance or comedy um what was that like for you yeah i, I remember even in some of the interviews uh, i was asked so how do you write when you're a muslim how do you how do you how, how do you think how do you as a muslim and and that you know my response was you know i don't sort of wake up and just have a little oh i've woken up as a muslim now and i'm just gonna jump in the shower as a muslim and you know what, I'm going to open the shampoo as a Muslim because yeah. obviously there's more to us than one part of our identity. And, you know, faith is one thing, but the human emotion doesn't discriminate against skin colour or faith or gender. or It just uh, pierces right through them and, and they're felt. That's why when you watch a brilliant drama or... Uh, or just empathise with another person, it's on a human level. Absolutely. And, and in terms of, because you uh, co-wrote it with Andrew Knight, who's a very um, experienced yeah. screenwriter, what was that process like? Yeah, it was incredible. So just to take you back, the, mm. the writing process was about five years mm. and then two years to finance it 
So on the seventh year, I think he came out and there was a time where I was getting too old to play Ali and they were going to cast someone else. And uh, and I ended up actually auditioning and, and I said to the producer, give me a chance to audition at least. Um, and uh, so the, the takeaway out of that is what I'm trying to say is that the patience it's, is in this game that we're in, you know, because what's the reason behind why you, you're doing what you're doing? If it's just fame and money, well, that's, they're pretty shallow reasons. If they're a byproduct, great. I'm not going to say no to any of those, but it's not the reason. And so patience is, is a big part of it. With Andrew Knight, man, he's a school. Like, I did an entire uni degree over those five years working with him because he was, at the time, he was writing The Water Diviner and Hacksaw Ridge. And uh, so, you know, he'd be on the phone with you know, Mel Gibson and <laughs> Russell Crowe. Like, not, he wasn't like, doing it to go, look, I'm on the phone with these guys, but that's what he was working on. And of course, he creator of Sea Change and, and, and Broken Shore, and all, all sorts of, you know, Jack Irish, all sorts of great Australian drama that's, you know, he's a doyen of Australian screenwriting, right? And and I remember the first time I walked in, I walked in with, with my laptop. Remember, I'm just a kid. I'm like, you know, I don't know, 23, 24. Here I am with Andrew Knight and I uh, had my laptop and I opened it and I said to him, oh, Andrew, I'm going to learn so much from you. And, you know, and he said that day, that first day, he said, OK, let's have our coffee, close the laptop, go home and come tomorrow. And it was a bit of like the you hear of the, you know, the, the wise monk says to his mm-hmm. students. It was a bit of that. I was like, what? Did I say anything? And he said, when you look at me like that, you're not going to be able to be free to give all your ideas because you'll be a yes man. Anything I say, you're going to take like gospel. And I don't want any of that. We're peers. And that was huge, not just for my confidence, but just to be able to really come in and and share that story with him without feeling judged, without feeling he's going to go, what is this guy? Because by then I'd written some short films, I'd written half an hour TV, but nothing as big as a feature film. And, and you know, you in, in the industry that we're in, whether we like it or not, deep down sometimes we're always trying to prove ourselves. If it's not to other people, it's, well, it's definitely to ourselves. When we look in the mirror, are we happy? And there was a bit of that, but... I came back the next day and I was just comfortable in my skin. So, which is a testament to his, uh, yeah, his nous and, and, and humility and knowledge. And yeah, like I said, I went to school in that, on those five years, I learned a great deal that all the writing courses I'd done to that point uh, combined, uh, I didn't learn those things from. So uh, it was just a, uh, life-changing experience and I owe a lot to him. There's, um, yeah, there's something really incredible about having people you admire in the industry treat you as peers. I, yeah, I found that I have very much, um, we'll get to the title of your memoir in a moment, um, but I'm, I have very much been the good Muslim girl my whole life and a lot of that involves respecting your elders. Yeah. And so... <laughs> <laughs> in yes. some of those rooms, it can be hard to feel mm. like you can speak up or be honest. And so the fact that Andrew Knight did this for you and, you know, I've had mentors and peers do the same for me, I think is, yeah, really important in the encouragement and development of, I think, younger artists. I did joke around with him uh, mm. afterwards that I said, you know, I only said the thing about respecting you because you're old. <laughs> <laughs> And, I didn't take that. And he, no, he didn't take it too well. And then he did mention that, you know, if uh, in, in, in 20 years time, mm. someone is like you will sit beside you on that, in this chair, writing a script with you. And they will say that and you will feel the sting 
of that. And then I remember saying, oh, 20 years, man, you know, 20 years, you know, let that, that, that day come. But, uh, but you know, 10 years has passed since that conversation. So there you Yeah, go. I'm like, it's coming. It's coming for all of us. I wanted to ask you about the process of writing your memoir, Good Muslim Boy, um, because, I mean, you just said that you weren't reading or writing English when you arrived and to write a memoir which was published in like prose and then to take it and adapt it for stage what was that like yeah that's question what is it like it was you know sometimes when we're doing things we don't really feel what's Mm -hmm. happening it's like you know athletes when they look back on their career and they go oh my god I've you know got a silver medal or gold medal, whatever it is. Uh, when it was happening, uh, those sort of adulations and accolades came sort of a bit quick, which uh, you, you need to sort of to, to just remember to ground yourself because I was a bit in the air for, for a bit of it. And, you know, especially after the literary award, I was just – Walking around like I was king shit, you know, I was just the, but, but it soon dawned on me that, uh, you know, we're all king shit and we're all, you know, we've got everything, we've got a lot to offer and you, you have to bring yourself back to earth a, a, a bit. I, I remember that moment that epiphany kind of happened remember Sydney Film Festival where we won, you know, best film and all that sort of stuff, which is actually uh, opening uh, in a, next week, right, Since for the Sydney Siders, um, with uh, Sheila's film, who I'm working on, who produced Ali's Wedding, her film's opening yes. night film. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I remember, so they had the car come pick me up and they put us up at the hotel. And uh, I remember I'd forgotten my jacket and I, I turned around to the driver and I said, oh, mate, I gave him the room key and I said, oh, my jacket's upstairs. It's there. And as soon as I gave him the key in that split moment, I thought, you fucking idiot. <laughs> what the fuck has gotten into your head? <laughs> and I was so embarrassed. And, like, I didn't mean anything by it, but just the mm-hmm. fact that it came, it happened, mm-hmm. I... I yeah, just hated myself. I'm like, no, this is not right. And went up and got my jacket, came down. And that was the moment that I just went, oh, oh I want to. I can't say 100% I do that, but I want to never have that moment again. Like that's because, uh, yeah, it's it's really important for us to, yeah, just stay. So, so the process you ask, it's as it's happening, it's all – up in the air and 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 exciting and grueling because it's you're a writer you know you can't tell someone else hey can you cover this shift for me like yes. you know, no one's gonna come write those words for you and even even like acting maybe you can, they can have an understudy or any other job you know and the surgeon's not in all right we'll ring the other surgeon who's on call like um but there are certain jobs writing being one of them that it's you, but if it's not you, it goes to someone else. They'll get a ghostwriter or whatever. But if you want it to be yours and tell that story authentically, then you need to put in the hard yards. So I remember working uh, long, long hours uh, without romant- wanting to romanticize the idea of working hard. But you, you, it is part of it that you, you put in a lot of hours. You just don't go out on weekends and you just can't have no life. You got to balance it out, but uh, but you know I ended up going to a lot of parties after the book was published. So <laughs> you, you, you celebrate those wins, you know. I feel like in the arts, nothing's guaranteed. So exactly, that's it. Nothing things happen. And you have to really enjoy what you have. And I found that at this time, this year, I was doing a production called Them which was at the Art Centre, to be at the Art Centre, which is an, uh, the Art Centre Melbourne, for those who are in Sydney, and a regional Victoria tour. And on opening night at 8pm, we went into our sixth lockdown. And so just before we went on stage and devastating, but cut to four weeks earlier where we just said, you know, we, we're not sure of the situation because we'd already gone to a fifth lockdown and out of it. And we said, 
let's just enjoy the rehearsals. Let's just have fun together. Let's sing and play music and 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 back then when we could go out to dinners, let's and every night the ensemble would go out to dinner and and there was this camaraderie that really made the sting of it when it was gone uh hurt less and yeah the idea that just being appreciative and grateful because again that moment of get me the coat can happen it's kind of can creep in without you knowing you know you get a role that you've been you've died to get at the mtc or stc or whatever belvoir and then three weeks into rehearsals you're complaining about the coffee break or something you know like it's you just got to remember it's all it's all fleeting and and but beautiful and enjoy the beauty of it it's not to say that not to have robust discussions with your director about a script or about the portray the character but uh don't be a drama queen like your <laughs> Well, I was I was going to ask you about that actually. You've worked with a number of different directors on stage and on screen. Um, as an actor, for you, what do you think is the key part of maintaining a strong creative relationship with a director? Collaboration. Collaboration. Theater, film, even <laughs> is respect the collaborative nature of of it and of the process because the moment you think your word is more valuable than anyone else's is when you've lost the game you've you've lost the inter, even if people don't tell you you lose their respect because why should anyone respect you if you think your opinion only matters and remembering that it's a even if you're a lead or if you're a if you've got a bit, bit part, whatever it is, and if you're a lead, actually, you've got to be even more collaborative because you've got more uh, contact time with heads of departments if you're on a film set, and uh, you know, with and and you might have more of a say in the costume that you wear. But yeah, just not trying to enforce, and it's a fine balance between uh, having strong opinions and really speaking up when you see injustice, unfairness, and thinking that it's only you whose opinion should be heard. And when you straddle that line, you just exude confidence. And and also people then, when you speak, will take your opinion seriously. But if you're constantly just throwing ideas that why isn't no one's listening to me and and to be fair, not many people do that, but it's surprising how many do uh, not don't see the that 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 storytelling and theatre making is a collaborative form, and they just get carried away with their with their role. But you know, you take out the music of a theatre production, it'll be different. You take out the costumes, you take out the props. You like everything is as vital to one an, to one another, and it's just being respectful of that dynamic and of course at the end of the day it's the actors who are on stage so you can if you feel strongly about something definitely mount an argument and mount your case but remember that ultimately you serve the director and their vision and also if you trust the director or not which is another question because if you trust them then why why are you always arguing but uh, if if you don't, then it's a lesson that you learn from, and you can, yeah, you can still be assertive but respectful. Yeah. Well, we have a couple of questions from the audience actually, which might touch on this. The first is, um, any tips for anyone starting out in theatre during COVID? You know, we'll be speaking to a lot of students in this conversation. Do you have any thoughts or advice? Yeah, it's a good question because COVID is a very it's a game changer. <laughs> game changer uh we're slowly shifting out of it uh just remember that the art of storytelling dates back to thousands and thousands of years and planet earth has been through a lot through those thousands and thousands of years whether it's you know noah's flood or <laughs> if it was the uh, any of the other natural or other pandemics that have come and gone. Remember, there was a pandemic similar to this about a century ago. So 
still theater has survived theater and and it blossoms actually in a way there's a Sohrab Seferi a Persian poet he has a great thing about it. he says you know I may be very hard on the surface and and wherever I look is arid land barren land it's a desert but remember the desert rose come it grows out of that hard harsh land so yes you're experiencing this harsh difficult time but that beautiful rose can only grow out of this hardness so harness all this energy and convert it into a way of yeah whether you want to write stories or you want to do scenes with your friends or um you know just becoming more active and remember that stories yeah they bypass COVID and all that or you know elections and what whatever they that they they stand at the test of time and it's the oldest art form you know theater so uh, don't be sort of dissuaded by that or discouraged by by that and just grab now that you can have more people at your place I remember we used to do this a lot where we do and without getting carried away of oh we'll do this every day we'll do this every week you know once a fortnight once a month we'd get together and we'd do 10 scenes and uh you know we had like a hollywood night where it was where you choose a famous monologue from and then we had nights of obscure movies and and you choose a monologue from them or you do a scene with friends and it, it look at like athletes in in during covid they can't train they but they found a way then they had the tennis players in here last year quarantine in hotels now anyone who's played sport knows that if you leave something you, you don't run for a week you have sore muscles after running like now they're at high level athletes and what do they do they keep you know they get a treadmill inside they hit the ball they set up a little wooden thing on the wall and they they continue so you always find ways in iran where i come from uh, has strong censorship on movies but that censorship allows films like a separation to win the oscar but it only comes out of that harsh environment that so because in iran the directors could throw their head in the ring and say you know what I'll throw in the towel and say censorship i can't make a film askar farhadi makes a film that wins the oscar so you can always find uh yeah ways to 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 get around i hope i've answered it i know it's not very practical no, absolutely i mean some dreamy response but i mean spoken like a true artist when you started quoting persian poets i was like yeah there we go big guns that practically um, get, get scripts and get friends and, and keep doing it absolutely i mean it's really just harnessing what you said that theater is a collaborative form um i have another question uh from the audience uh, a goal of mine is to start a theater arts company a non-profit to use theater to help refugees and refugee causes any tips on working with migrants that's great that's great fantastic uh, remember uh migrants are a there's this great reservoir of stories there um they have you can mine them for for stories but when you include them as well so they're not just being used for the sake of that when they are feeling included uh that's when you really have a win-win because you get to have your non-profit uh theater company but also giving lending a voice and and being strong in the decisions that you make there will be a lot of stories that it's what resonates with you don't feel obliged to tell a story just because it's sad or because it's harrowing or because it's funny or whatever what resonates with you like i'm sure whoever's asked has many reasons why they want to do the the company but the, then what are you excited about like the people who grab scripts you know we were excited by the the films and the genre of films that we picked or the plays that we wanted to read so what excites you and work off that and when you're getting people uh people's stories and 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 asking them uh for stories and then including them uh then they'll be more inclined to share those stories with you but yeah being clear on 
what is it that you want to say? Why do you want do you want, do you want to tell that story? Because just it being tragic or harrowing or that's not good enough. That's you know, but but if there's another le level, another layer, a deeper layer, then become meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a question for you that actually I think gets asked a lot to female artists, but I think you would have an interesting answer. In your interviews, you speak uh, really highly of your dad and you're also a dad. So how does being a parent shape your work as an artist? Uh, the same that, you know, being a son shapes, it shapes you as being an artist, the same as being uh, a man, in my case, shapes you as an artist because we have multiple, yeah, multiple skins that we we wear, multiple masks. Yeah, being, being a dad, see, I became a dad when I was very young, I was 20. So, uh, so that's a very, you know, I still think it's a young age to become a, become a father. And it, when it happens, you, you don't really know what's going on. You're still at school or at uni and uh, it's, and it's life changing, but uh, it's it definitely in my case anyway makes me more maybe protective even of the stories I want to tell. You know, I've got two girls and uh, and what kind of uh, yeah, we we all want to become sort of role models and leaders in a field that we like, and uh, and it's influenced by. Who we are. My mum, of course, like she was one of my strongest supporters, even though she still says to me, get a real job, you know, <laughs> like um, she's still that 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 backing of that lioness can be felt because, you know, she raised seven kids during wartime whilst dad was on the front line. So it was just her and my aunties. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, it, it, it's the multiple layers of who you are just make you more yeah, desperate to want to tell the stories you want to tell. Um, I'm very aware that you have taken time out from a writer's room to join us. You are in the middle of a full day's work. Um, I had two very quick questions from the audience and then I'm going to let you go. The first one, is your memoir published in the USA? It's uh, You can get it on Kindle on Amazon, yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah. Um, and the second one, this might be longer and I feel like you might have answered it, but I will ask you anyway. Um, they thank you for the chat um, and they wanted to ask, how do you find moving across the various disciplines in which you work? What do you like about them and when they bleed into each other? Which are your favourite combinations? What a great question. Yeah, I, 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 I love everything I do, but secretly... It's like, you know, when you have a lot of kids and like my mom, she's got seven kids. <laughs> she has a favorite, like, you know, and, and you, we kind of know, but also she loves everyone equally. So I, I love everything that I do equally, but I, I just love the acting part, being on stage, being on set. Uh, I feel uh, where I'm most alive. Uh, cause, and I love the story conference part of writer's rooms. I find that I excel there because of my passion and, and, uh, you know, just the, what I think I sometimes bring to the table it doesn't always work, but it's what I enjoy doing. So, uh, writing itself is, is quite like looking at the blank screen and the cursor just flashing like taunting you write something write something that blank screen and then you know you have to fill it with in a case of a feature film 100 pages or a tv whatever it's quite daunting and i find now i've been doing this for years i've written a fair bit but still that first page is so daunting so i i, I really enjoy when i get to do uh, a production in between my writing gigs, but hey, we can't all be choosers and have everything. And I'm always grateful that I have uh, the ability to work on my craft. Um, but uh, and then stand up is more of a side thing, really. I get invited mm -hmm. to, to, to do stuff, but I don't 
uh, actively sit and write a one hour bit. Like I've I've got some material that I've uh, compiled over the years, and when I get a call, uh, I, I love to do it because you know. I, I like to make people laugh. Not that I, I think I'm funny, but I like to make people laugh because there's enough sadness in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think you've made us laugh a few times today. So thank you so much for joining us, Osama, and for taking time out from what sounds like a very, very busy day for you. Yeah, and I had my second COVID shot yesterday. And <laughs> oh, my God, and I, and I haven't told the producers. Because you know when you tell someone you're sick, then... Whatever idea you throw, they're like, oh, that's because he's sick. <laughs> I'm powering through and I'm, you know, I have I just finished the, you know, the Barocca and all this sort of stuff. But um, I, 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 I was I, wondering why your drink was yellow. Yeah, it's the Barocca. So I am, uh, yeah, I hope I didn't fade too much during that uh, conversation. But I've enjoyed every minute of it. And thanks for inviting me. Thanks tonight. Thanks to everyone who's actually sitting down and, listening to my garbage so yeah thank you <laughs> pleasure thank you brilliant all right